I hope we set the stage for Barbara, Vic, and Katie. Uh, the audience is engaged. I'm thrilled. Uh, there is good energy in the room, and uh, we're now looking forward to, to your presentation uh, and learn about uh, your strategic view on the topic, uh, as well as how you would set the priorities. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, hello. How are you? Is everybody excited? Ready to go? Yes. yes. So. Pardon? Mike. Mike. Yes. Speak into the mic, Kathy says. So, <laughs> hello. It's me again. I'm uh, Barbara Chow. I'm the Education uh, Program Director at the Hewlett Foundation. And it's just really wonderful to see so many familiar faces. And actually, we're still a little excited when we see a lot of unfamiliar faces, I got to say, because the OER community, I think, was small enough for long enough that um, you could literally recognize everybody else in the room. And now that is um, beginning to change a lot, and that is an exciting moment. So um, I'd just like to add my uh, voice of welcome, and thank you for, I know many of you have traveled for many, many hours to get here, so thank you for that. I'd also like to thank our um, colleagues and hosts at the Berkman Center. Um, they've done a huge amount of work to put together a really terrific program for you, so please join me in at least uh, thanking them first for the first time. Um, so when you think about it, in many ways, the Berkman Center and their work, their sort of seminal work, is this is actually one of probably a number of intellectual homes for the whole OER movement. So it's very fitting in some ways that we're having this conference here. But before we head into an all OER, all the time extravaganza, and in part to launch that, um, we just wanted to share with you a broad overview of the Hewlett Foundation's education program, including an update in some of the areas that you may not be as familiar with. To do this, I'm just gonna kick things off with three sentences about our broad um, aims in education and a short update on our deeper learning strategy, which we introduced to many of you two years ago. Kathy Nicholson will then follow with a kind of the classic state of OER in 2011, and I think there's some very interesting and surprising statistics that she's going to present to you and trends that you'll find very interesting and exciting. And then Vic is going to sum up with um, his own version, I think, of the heat map. You just saw the trends and the opportunities. He'll connect our OER and our deeper learning work together. Then he'll end with four asks. I'm just going to uh, get ready for them because um, there are some specific things that we think you can do to really move this movement along over the next year. We're also actually joined by two other Hewlett Foundation colleagues. I don't know if they're here, but Chris Shear, are you around, Chris? Um, he handles our policy work um, in the deeper learning arena, and Mark Chun, who is right there, who just actually joined us last week and uh, works on new models and our research agenda. Because we, we have a lot to tell you, so we have actually um, won't have a lot of time for a Q&A actually right now, although we'll try to do a little bit of that. But we're really very eager to get your feedback, so please find any of us and, and give us your reactions to what you've heard at any point during the conference. So moving on to the Hewlett Education Program. We support three key areas at the foundation. The first really involves advancing educational equity in our beloved state of California through policy advocacy and innovative research with a particular focus on state policy. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's maybe of less broad interest, but please grab us again if you're interested in this piece of our work. The second includes our commitment to open educational resources. Of course, that's going to be uh, the bulk of our presentation today, so I won't say anything more about that. Our third component supports an initiative to promote what we're calling deeper learning in K-12 classrooms throughout the United States. So let me start with an update on deeper learning. At the broadest level, our goal is to provide students so you see the skills and knowledge they will need to be successful in 21st century work and civic life. When we asked ourselves, we asked you, we asked experts, and we interrogated the research base about what that actually entails. It is these kind of core competencies that actually emerged. The ability to think critically and solve complex problems, 
to communicate effectively in both written and oral form, to work collaboratively, and to learn how to learn, all applied to the mastery of rigorous academic content, math, science, literature. Of course, you know, these skills, we didn't invent them. They've been around for a long time. And our best schools, I think, have always delivered these, these uh, competencies. But it would be our contention that in the 21st century knowledge economy, they will actually be required of anybody who aspires to a living wage job. Our public education system is the most important tool we have to deliver them, particularly to children in communities of poverty who have few other means of acquiring them. That's why we're in this area. So here's one data point from that research. It was a survey of Fortune 500 companies. They were asked to rank the most important attributes of their new employees in priority order. And you can see that these key skills were at the top of their list. And these skills are not only important, actually, for a career, they're also important for college. In addition to basic math and literacy, Colleges are demanding these critical reasoning and communication skills. For example, a faculty study conducted by the academic senates of the California public education system identified the disconnect between the deeper learning tasks that will be asked of students once they go to college and their students' preparation for those tasks. They indicated that only 33% of incoming uh, students are, sorry, are, are ready for those analytic writing tasks. So these, these sort of studies give you some sense, I think, of the lack of focus on these higher order competencies in K-12 classrooms. We've also been looking for a sort of a broader gauge measure to help us determine or assess where our schools stand. The best proxy we've come up with is the PISA. I don't know if you've heard of that. The Program for International Student Assessment. It's run by OECD which is an international economic body. PISA measures communication and critical thinking in three subjects, math, reading, and science. And against that measure, the results for the United States are not positive. Hard to see, at the very bottom, we clock in at 31st, in 31st place. So I think what that means, if you sort of put some of these things together, is that those Fortune 500 companies that we were just talking about now have literally dozens of other countries from which to source their talent. And for the United States, anyway, it means that we're not only at risk of losing our lower-skilled jobs, but also those involving more advanced skills. So from here, I'm going to pivot from the problem that we're trying to solve to the solution we're pursuing. In our view, economic success and civic participation will depend upon the acquisition of deeper learning skills. The school systems are a major vehicle for delivering them, but they're not doing so, at least not in large numbers. So what do we do about that? How do we get schools to change? Kind of our answer comes in the, in the form of four core areas of grant making. The first has to do with resetting the goals themselves, the learning goals and the requirements for schools. It's our policy work to actually shift to these higher aspirations for students and to hold themselves accountable for achieving them. The second testing for deeper learning is the measurement system. It's the way in which schools actually measure their progress towards meeting the goals that they set for themselves. More about this in a moment. The third, strengthening teaching capacity, has to do with the tools, materials, professional development programs that support deeper learning changes in the classroom. We think that the OER community can play a hugely important role in many of these areas, but particularly here. You'll hear more about that from Vic in a moment. The last, learning, evaluating, and demonstrating what works, refers to a laboratory of innovation, innovative model schools, where we can test out new approaches that can be replicated nationwide. So High Tech High, for example, is one of the model schools we work with. Um, Larry Rosenstock, if he's not here right now, uh, runs that school, and he'd be a great person to talk to about that. So let me now switch to just one of these areas, just to give you a sense of what we're trying to do. 
more specifically in what our grant making strategy is. So that is on testing. I just want to be very concrete about the shift we're trying to enact. And I'll, I'll, to do that, I'll draw from a couple of examples from US AP history, the US AP history exam. So are you ready? This, uh, this, so here's a question for you. This is from the 2006 US AP history exam. I'll give you a chance to read it. You have an advantage because Massachusetts is on this uh, list. But uh, any ideas? Uh, what the answer to this is? No. Um, well, it turns out <laughs> the answer is Massachusetts. B, um, but you know, that's neither here nor there, right? It doesn't tell you a lot about whether a student knows anything about history. They could have guessed, they could have memorized this. They, um, it, 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 it does not tell you, it does not inform you. Well, here's actually a question from their um, new USAP history exam, and they haven't done this yet, but they're redesigning their, their exam, and this is a new question. It's long, so I won't, uh, maybe just sort of breeze through that. I think it, it's clear, at least it was certainly clear to us, that this is a better question. It asks students to understand these historical periods, to be able to explain why they're important, to choose dates not even on here, and I think you can imagine that a, that a student responding to this question is doing a much better job of demonstrating their critical reasoning and writing skills. So that's kind of what, that's what we're trying to do. The, I th at, at a broader level, the question then is, how do we get a lot more questions like this one to permeate state exams instead of the kinds that we have right now? And I think the good news here is actually that the testing world is in a state of huge transition right now in the United States. <clears throat> in 2010, the federal government awarded $350 million to collections of states to redo their tests, and we're hoping to measure these higher order skills that we just talked about. It's a huge opportunity. Actually, at Hewlett, we've been very involved with the work of these assessment consortia. But with opportunity comes challenge, and one of the biggest ones is that of cost. So if you kind of look at this question again, see a couple things. It says write, it says write again. That involves writing. Writing usually involves human graders. Human graders add both costs and delay. And in these very tight fiscal times for states, anything that adds costs can be something of a showstopper. So what can we do about that problem? Our answer to that has actually been, a, I think, a really interesting project that Vic has been leading around uh, creating a competition, which is actually being run uh, through the same folks who ran the X Prize, to uh, demonstrate the degree to which technology can be relied upon to aid in essay grading. In other words, can a machine come up with roughly the same grade as a human? To answer this, we're actually running two competitions. The first actually pulled together all of the major testing organizations that have scoring engines into kind of a bake-off. So they're actually testing their algorithms against a common data set. The second, which I think has been really fascinating, it's, an open, it's a competition on the open web right now where we're uh, sort of letting anybody try their hand at the same challenge with the same data set. And so, in fact, you could do it. It's, uh, it there's about two weeks left or a week left, I think, in the competition. There's $100,000 there. And um, what's been really fascinating to us particularly is that some of the front runners in the second competition are all, all data experts, but they're not education experts. So in fact, uh, leading this cheerful fellow is Martin O'Leary. He's a glaciologist from the University of Cambridge, and he's actually been at the top of the stack. Most of the folks actually um, in this competition are, have similar backgrounds, they're actuaries, they predict the weather, they're predicting um, your, your scores on essays too. So that's been um, great. We're actually gonna announce the results of this in a couple of weeks, so stay tuned for how that went. That, and that's just to give you a sense of, again, 
how we're approaching some of these issues. So that concludes my brief update, and I'm going to turn this over to Kathy. Great. Thanks, Barbara. <laughs> For those of you uh, who I haven't met yet, my name's Kathy Nicholson, and I work with the uh, education program with our um, open educational resources portion of the portfolio. Um, so today I'm going to provide an, o an overview of our OER infrastructure portfolio and also provide some highlights of the past year since the last time that we met. So to recap, um, our fundamental beliefs are that knowledge is a public good and that openness in principle increases access and increases quality through multiple contributions. So as you can see here, our ultimate goal is to equalize access to knowledge for teachers and students around the globe through OER. And with such an ambitious goal, how do we get there? Well, we hope to make open as much of an expectation and an aspiration in mainstream education as green is in the environment movement. We define mainstream as reaching millions of teachers and hundreds of millions of students. And that requires building and supporting an ecosystem that can support mainstream adoption. And it also requires research and supportive evidence and constant innovation. And we see these two goals as mutually reinforcing. So to support in integration into the mainstream, we need to demonstrate how OER can help increase educational capacity. Um, and we have four pillars here in, to support that part. The first is high quality OER supply. And this is a support of OER producers who are sustainably providing high quality resources uh, for the core academic subjects in K-12 and higher education. And our key issue here is to continuing to develop the resources that we have, improving it, and aligning it with standards where that's possible. The second piece is supportive OER policies. These are policies that remove restrictions on OER funding and implementation and provide incentives to support OER. And we, as OER continues to gain steam, we need to be able to share more examples of sample policies and continue our strong advocacy in support of OER. The third piece are implementable OER standards. And these are standards that guide OER development and increase discoverability, interoperability, and accessibility. And here, this is all in, um, in support of continuing to help educators and learners find and use OER. And then the fourth piece of this is under field building. And those are conferences like these that are about OER and support OER. There are awareness raising efforts. There are collaborations within the field. And here we see a key issue is expanding the breadth and the depth of OER adoption, including our own community, but beyond our own community. How do we uh, create more outreach and support for OER? Capacity must also be supported by evidence and innovation. So here we have influential research. We talked a little bit about that before in the heat map piece. And this is research that we think would spur demand for and the guide the production of OER. And the need is to shift the question to not just what is OER, but what impact is OER having on teaching and learning and gathering more evidence to support that. And finally, we know that change is constant. So we must continue to grow and change as a field. This opportunistic innovation portion of the portfolio supports innovations that demonstrate strong potential to transform teaching and learning and reach the scale that we're aiming for. So I think you'll see that over the course of the next two and a half days, we've uh, structured much of the agenda around these pillars. And one of the goals of this meeting is to encourage more integration among these pillars. And we hope that you'll have many opportunities to meet colleagues old and new and continue to further these conversations about how to integrate these, these pillars further and continue to move the field forward. We've talked a lot um, in the past couple of years about crossing the chasm. And what we mean by that is moving OER from the niche into the mainstream. 
And we know that that's certainly not a fast or an easy change. But over the past year, we've been excited to see more and more examples of OER making that leap and of large educational institutions moving in that direction. First, I'll note there was an increase in academic recognition for students who take free online classes. Higher education institutions like MIT are exploring expanding the university's free online courses and allowing would-be students to earn official certificates from a program called MITx. And Stanford University is taking the democratization of educational resources to another level with their massive open online courses. The artificial intelligence course alone was, that was open last fall registered over 100,000 learners from around the world. And while these two efforts are not openly licensed, we think there's a lot of potential for OER as institutions recognize the demand for high quality, free, and open classes, and the need for academic recognition for taking these classes. And perhaps the most, uh, one of the most progressive in this area is OER University, which is creating a global network of post-secondary institutions who will accredit learning from OER courses towards credible credentials. And OERU to date has succeeded in securing over 15 anchor partners in support of this goal and counting. And moving from the institutional to the state level, the New York State Education Department is supporting the statewide implementation of Common Core Learning Standards through the New York Regents Research Fund. And the state recently issued two RFPs uh, for the creation of cre Common Core aligned curriculum modules, tools, resources, and professional development, and also for a video library that would demonstrate effective teacher and principal practices. And all of this will be openly licensed and support over 200,000 teachers in New York. So these examples are just a few of a growing number that demonstrate the evolution of OER from small pilot projects toward mainstream implementation at the hundreds of thousands level. And we still have a ways to go before we reach the millions that we're trying to aim for. But we see this as a very positive indication of growth. So beyond institutions, we also see OER starting to increase uh, or to cross the chasm at the state, federal, and global levels as well. In the United States, uh, legislation supporting the use of K-12 OER was passed in Utah and in Washington. And California is exploring requiring, requiring open licenses as a priority in a community college uh, open textbook funding RFP. At the federal level, open licenses were listed as a priority in 11 funding programs. And during Open Education Week, which happened not that long ago, in support of the launch of the Why Open Education Matters video competition, Department of Education Secretary Arne Duncan voiced his support for OER, stating, quote, that OER can not only accelerate and enrich learning, they can also substantially reduce costs for schools, families, and students, which is a pretty strong endorsement. And around the world, we have several examples of OER starting to make that leap. In the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil, Legislation requiring all uh, educational resources bought by the city um, was passed, and it was requiring all of those resources to be openly licensed. And Poland recently announced the equivalent of $14 million to support digital and free textbooks for grades four through six, all licensed under a Creative Con uh, Commons attribution license or equivalent. Uh, breaking news today, I'm not sure if uh, many of you have been on the on email list, but the World Bank uh, just announced op an open access policy and is launching an open knowledge repository all under a Creative Commons license. So that's pretty exciting news that broke today. I'll say uh, also governments in New Zealand, the Netherlands, and Australia also made commitments to release their data sets under open licenses. And then later this year, UNESCO and the Commonwealth of Learning will host the 2012 uh, World OER Congress, which will not only celebrate uh, the coining of the, the 10th anniversary of the coining of the term OER, but also encourage governments around the world to support the new Paris Declaration on OER. 
And Sir John, Daniel, and Zainab Baroglu have a short talk on this on Wednesday, and I'll speak more about that. But we should note that increased attention to OER also made OER a target at multiple levels. Openness was threatened with proposed legislation in the US, including the Stop Online Piracy Act, or SOPA, and proposals to strip OER from the Department of Labor funding. But thanks to the public education efforts of the OER community and many others, these proposals were taken off the table. But I think we can be assured that as OER garners more attention, that these attacks won't be the last. In the commercial sector, we had a few pleasant surprises. Blackboard, um, which is one of the largest LMS uh, learning management system vendors in the world, uh, because of high demand from professors and their students, added a share button to their software, which allows faculty to share their course materials and select a Creative Commons license for materials that they choose to make freely available. And we're all pretty familiar with uh, YouTube, which is one of the largest or if not the largest online video platform in the world with over 4 billion views per day. YouTube is already pretty OER friendly because uh, they enable language translation on any materials um, for any content that's closed captioned already. So that is nice. But this past year, they also added an option to, to select a Creative Commons license for any content that was uploaded. So that was great. These developments make it much easier for educators and learners to choose and to openly uh, uh, and find openly licensed materials. We'll also note that in the small business sector, the University of Pennsylvania hosted a business plan competition, out of which seven were OER startups. So we're seeing support for OER at the large and small business levels. Now let's look at OER by the numbers. For the past three years, we've run a small pilot project called OER Analytics. And about 20 OER sites have volunteered to put a specific line of Google Analytics code on their sites so that we could create a dashboard roll-up of all of these sites and take a look at these analytics um, so we can learn more about how they're growing and how users are engaging with these sites. And we use it as a loose proxy to understand the growth of the OER movement and put some numbers behind it, at least in terms of access and the user base. So one of the metrics that we look at is uh, web visits year on year. And it has decreased for some and wildly decreased for others. I didn't put up all 19 or 20 uh, lines up there. But we would expect to see that in a fairly new field that is starting to mature. But overall, we've seen about a 10% increase in the number of visits um, compared to last year which is consistent with internet growth overall. But what's particularly exciting about, uh, about these numbers up here is the fact that for every single site in the pilot study, um, the number of mobile visits vastly increase. So this is a real opportunity. Vic is going to talk a little bit more about that in his section. But that was pretty exciting. And while we're on the topic of numbers, let's touch on a little bit more about the data that we've gathered. And I'll, again, I'm just going to highlight a couple of examples. I just mentioned the OER analytics project, which helps us understand more about the number of visits, what countries users are accessing um, OER sites from, what language, how long they're engaged with a particular site, for example. And one insight came from an analysis of the hippocampus site which showed that its materials were consistently being used during the school day. And why does this matter? Because this indicates a possible shift of OER being used in the classroom as part of everyday school instruction, and not just as part of a project or part of an after-school program. And this bears further investigation, certainly. But you can see how this could, is use of data that helps us inquire lead down a road of further inquiry about how OER is impacting learning and teaching practices. Another example is a Utah Open Textbooks, which is a small study this past year that created a customized version of the CK-12 Flexbooks that were printed and delivered to schools for about $5 or less per book. And the study compared test scores for students who used open textbooks versus students who used traditional textbooks and found that there was no difference in student learning 
leading to the conclusion that OER could provide significant cost savings. But there will be a follow-on study for this uh, later on this year. So you can see that we're starting to gather data about OER impact and efficacy, but I'll note that this is the most nascent area within our OER field, and we certainly need to gather more information about and data and evidence about how OER is impacting teaching and learning. So my last slide here is about a stronger OER community. I spoke just about a few of uh, the many highlights since we last met. And unfortunately, it's impossible to cover all of the excellent work and the accolades that were won over the past year. But we hope that you get a feeling for what a tremendous year the past year really was for OER. And all of this is possible because of you, the OER community. It's things like the persistent collaboration with university chancellors, teacher trainers, and staff to integrate OER into the fabric of their institutional policies and classroom practices. It's the PERG's cross-country van tour of 40 campuses in 30 states to increase awareness about open textbooks. It's the work of communities like the OER Advocacy Coalition, the UNESCO OER Community, the Open Courseware Consortium, and informal networks of educators around the world. And it's all of you who attend conferences, organize conferences, and get OER on the agenda of new conferences like South by Southwest EDU. And it's everyone who provides peer reviews, conducts research, writes reports and publications, leads workshops, builds curriculum, and organizes events to increase OER awareness. And all of these efforts have led to national and international OER coverage in numerous education journals, the New York Times, USA Today, the International Herald Tribune, and the Huffington Post. A blog post about the recently released NMC Horizon report noted that the concept of open is no longer just a trend, but a real value entwined with ideals of transparency. So if we don't say it enough, during our meetings, our calls, our emails with you. We just wanted to say thank you for a job well done over the past year. And we still have a way to go, which Vic will cover next, but we really wanted to take this moment to, say, uh, to express our appreciation for all of your efforts and to keep this, move, this field moving forward to continue to equalize access to knowledge for teachers and learners around the world. Thanks. All right, thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everybody. My name is Vic Vucic, for those of you I don't know. I'm a program officer at the Hewlett Foundation, and I co-manage the OER portfolio with Kathy. And I also manage our scaling strategy for our deeper learning uh, portfolio, which includes kind of the how do we implement high quality assessments and how do we support teaching and learning at scale. So I'm going to touch a bit on opportunities and risks that we see in the next year. And then I'll jump into a little bit of how we're strategically blending our two portfolios of deeper learning and OER to get the mutually, mutually and symbiotically beneficial improving learning, but at a large scale. So starting with opportunities. Uh, one of the first trends that we expect to see is continued growth at the policy level. I think there's a lot of momentum going here. We've had a number of big wins this year and policy tends to be one of those things where after you get a couple of wins, it's easier for other places to follow. Um, and then also what's helping catalyze that, I think, is the new Common Core standards. Over the next two to three years, states are essentially going to be working pretty hard on figuring out how to support the implementation of these new standards, which includes revamping curriculum, professional development, and other supports. And in this, they will be reviewing curriculum adoption policies and processes and looking for opportunities to help uh, innovate and dramatically improve. And OER, I'm sure, will fit into many of those opportunities. On a global scale, as Kathy mentioned, we've had a number of big wins this year again, and we, we, uh, we expect that to continue. UNESCO this summer will have the big event. We just heard today from the World Bank. And again, this is an area where once you get the first couple of wins, it tends to be kind of a snowball effect. Grant opportunities. 
you'll be happy to hear we expect this to continue. <laughs> um, some of the big ones, the Trade Adjustment Act uh, has a couple more waves of $500 million a pop coming through. Um, so that's a big one. New York State uh, will be continuing to issue some RFPs around implementing the Common Core. We're excited. This is actually an area where one of our deeper learning grantees, Expeditionary Learning, recently won a $1.7 million grant to develop curriculum for elementary school Common Core English language arts. So, and all of this will be openly licensed. Next is open textbooks. This has been a pretty hot topic, a lot in the press, getting a lot of uh, momentum. I think one of the things I just mentioned briefly here, this is both at the K-12 and the higher ed level. Um, people talk about textbooks and we understand that, <laughs> there was a funny comment actually by uh, David Coleman, one of the authors of the uh, Common Core Standards at our board meeting. And he said, there's one thing that the US is still leading the world in and that's textbook size. And so, and, um, but I think what's important about textbooks and thinking through open textbooks is uh, it's an interface into the system. It's often how policymakers think and can reference and understand OER. If you talk about content modules and playlists and all these things, it's often, dip, it's difficult to grasp. It's difficult to put a price tag on and things like that. Whereas if you talk about textbooks, there's a budget line item for that. They understand what it is. They have all used them. And so it's a way to engage them. And I would almost consider it a Trojan horse in a way. Then once people use open textbooks, they can go to online courses and use simulations and start doing adaptive learning. But it's just a frame that the system really understands and tends to react to very well. Um, credentialing and MOOCs, Kathy mentioned a number of these efforts. What I just wanted to highlight here is, I'll be bold, and I actually think this is kind of a catalytic moment, um, especially built on a lot of the work that you all have done over the last 10 years. Um, both across OERU, MITx, and Stanford, in addition to the work over the years from Athabasca, Open University UK, Peer-to-Peer -peer University, among many others, this has really captured the imagination of people. And I think it's changed the conversation. I've noticed this as I'm talking to people in institutions where traditionally four-year higher ed institutions actually operate in a world of exclusivity and scarcity. It's often seen that higher education is a, is a scarce resource. It's expensive. It's difficult to access. And it's even in the system where there are incentives for these four-year higher ed institutions to accept fewer people based on acceptance rates, which often get rewarded in ranking criteria and various things. This is tragic in many ways. But I think with these efforts and the conversations that I'm seeing, this suddenly changed people's conception and the institution's conception, where it's not just how can we deliver education here, but it's a race to how many learners can we reach. Hundreds of thousands of learners at a time is possible. And there's still a lot of work to be done, a lot of design work. We have to understand assessment and many other things. But I think this year is actually an inflection point that has changed the imagination. And we've seen venture capital running into this, starting new entities. We've seen universities, major and all over the world, start to think about this. And, it, and the conversation shifted not from why should we do this to why aren't we doing this and how should we, how should we get in, engaged. Next, Kathy showed some pretty dramatic data here on mobile and tablets. And I think this actually poses an opportunity and a risk for the field. I'll dive into this a little bit. Uh, this is a former area of expertise. Uh, I used to work in the mobile industry. But um, there's been a lot of hype for 10 years that mobile's coming and it's changing the world. It's taken a little while, I think, um, for it to really get rich enough that you can start to understand how this can impact learning at large scale. But it's obvious that this is an area of huge growth, but it ends up the content publishing ecosystem here is different than in the generic open web. Um, the way that a lot of content is reached on mobiles is through apps and sourcing from specific iTunes App Store, Android App Store, Windows Mobile App Store, and things like that. And if you think about it, smartphones aren't designed to scan hundreds of courses and read those short descriptions and this and that and, and do a lot of things that traditionally OER requires, that you look at a lot of things and you kind of pick and choose and, and mix and mash, but you look through a lot of data and information at a time. So I think it's really important for the field to start thinking more strategically. I often hate leading with technology as a design principle. It's often the wrong thing to do and a trap that people fall into time and time again, including myself. But this is one area where I think it changes the system's dynamics. And it's clear that if we don't engage and get better at this, that you could be left behind. 
So some of the things I would recommend in this is the benefit here is that these app stores and these app, this app uh, format is wonderful for rapid iterative design and testing out demand and testing if things work. So you can rapidly put together various apps, put them up, and within a few months, you know if they're going to get users or not. You get that feedback very quickly rather than just putting up an open website and then monitoring over a year or two how well you do in the search rankings. So it's actually something that you can really leverage to test out demand, test out use. And if you think about how people use mobiles, um, it's often, especially smartphones, you know, very targeted. They have a specific question or they're looking for a very specific resource or something like that. Um, and it's much less of a browsing context. What I would recommend for people to do, one thing is, is go to the app stores, look at what are the top 100 education apps. What are they? Why are people using them? What's motivating them? And what services are those providing? Obviously, people find that compelling. And then think about how OER can help in those and, and work in those areas as well. Another thing is just to ask students. If you're teaching in a class, ask them if they use their mobile devices um, last night to help them with anything, uh, and what do they use them for? Basically start to gather information and really understand this space better and intentionally start to design for this because if we grab onto it, it's a huge opportunity. And if we miss it, unfortunately, it'll be tough to catch back up. And then lastly on opportunities, we are launching a project and it is uh, to help um, curate and improve the open educational resources page on Wikipedia. This is a reference that people point to time and time again, and it came to our attention that while it has some stuff on it, it could be much better than it is. So I think this is something we encourage people to engage in. This is something the community should uh, help curate and feed into this project. On the risks side, as Kathy mentioned, as we get policy successes, there will be attacks. And I think this is somewhere where we really need the community to continue to provide advocacy efforts to help uh, inform and support the public in terms of understanding and appreciating the value of OER. We need to continue to drive demand. You know, we often talk about from supply side push to demand side pull. The good news is we have some evidence of us succeeding in this. Blackboard putting a share button on due to the demand of professors is significant. That's the number, the biggest market shareholder and we're influencing their product design. That's not easy to do. Um, similarly, YouTube, huge platform and due to demand is integrating with Creative Commons. This is something we have to continue to drive. And as, you, uh, as we succeed in that, I think we'll see our jobs come much from become much from uh, kind of pushing the boulder up the hill to running ahead of it as it, run down, as it goes down the hill and making sure it gets to where we want it to go. <laughs> um, then uh, there's a risk that uh, supply needs to improve. Uh, as our opportunities get bigger, $500 million, we're not used to fulfilling that kind of capacity as a field in many ways in terms of curriculum development. Similarly, in New York, it's tens of millions of dollars for curriculum. And if we aren't able to fulfill the supply, there's a risk that some of these opportunities could not be renewed um, and could turn to proprietary or more traditional measures. I mentioned before uh, some of the risks of mobile. And I think globally, we've got some wins, we've got some momentum, but this is somewhere else where we just need to be diligent, continue to participate in pushing to, uh, to broaden global funding for OER to make sure uh, it can scale and have the impact all around the world. So now I'm gonna touch briefly on how we're blending our OER and deeper learning strategy. I'll take two examples. The first one is in our testing strategy. So Barbara highlighted, we're working with some consortia, we're doing this assessment prize, um, there's another area where we made a contract to a small for-profit startup, actually. It's called Show Evidence. And what it is, it's essentially a portfolio assessment platform. Teachers, schools, and districts can go online, create rubrics for what they want to assess, and then the students can upload any media, whether it's written text, audio, video, anything that they want. The teacher can then go and actually tag any of those resources anywhere on the resources for evidence of what's in the rubric. So two minutes and 32 seconds into the video, here's an example of this. 
uh, or in this part of the paragraph, this is evidence of this. And then it has the whole data and analytics engine behind it to gather all that information. And I will say the student can also tag themselves and say, this is what I'm demonstrating here. This is what I'm demonstrating here. And that gets collated as well. And then it can do inter-rater reliability across multiple graders, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for deeper learning, this was critical for a number of our proof point schools. It ends up, we are also funding a project for four of our proof point schools to actually develop rubrics aligned to the Common Core standards that will support assessing project-based learning for the Common Core standards. Now, the open part of this was, part of this effort was number one, that the rubrics in that project would be openly licensed for anyone to use or reuse. But part of the deal with Show Evidence, which they were enthusiastic about, was that they would set up the default on their platform that all rubrics will initially be Creative Commons attribution only license. And so people can always change it and do what they want, but the default is actually open. Um, and then they're creating an open community around the rubrics and trying to curate that and grow that so people share, create der derivatives, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a foray into kind of rich assessment and open to help us reach impact at scale. Second is um, on the teaching capacity side, we engage with the Buck Institute. Alfred Solis is here from, from there. Uh, they are one of the leading providers of professional development for project-based learning and deeper learning overall. Last year, they trained over 5,000 teachers face-to-face, -face, and they're growing at 30 to 50% a year, where they say demand is astronomical for this. So one thing we helped them with was give them a grant to help them improve their technology strategy and help them scale, and to start to experiment with methods that would allow them to grow as fast as possible while maintaining quality. Um, to give them credit before we even approached them, they were publishing some of their stuff under a Creative Commons license. Um, but now they will integrate some of that as they build even more as they build their online presence to support online courses for professional development and project-based learning. So in summary, to wrap up, there's four asks we have. First is to continue building awareness about OER. This is across advocacy, RFPs, supporting, um, supporting policy efforts and op-eds, et cetera. This is critical, and as I mentioned, even though we're getting a lot of wins and momentum, it actually, this actually gets more important because this is where you have to run ahead of the boulder as it starts really rolling and make sure this stuff gets done well. And that requires everyone's participation and engagement. Second is to encourage your government to support the Paris OER Declaration at UNESCO this summer. This is important, this is another inflection point, and everyone here can play a role in helping that happen. Third, continuing to organize and improve the research. I think we saw earlier how the research was the lighter part of the heat map. Um, we need to make sure that this research is asking, answering key questions, that it supports policy based on data and impact, and that helps practitioners improve so that they're impacting learning directly. And finally, help us integrate deeper learning into OER outcomes so that we can truly get the high quality of learning that we all want to happen at a large scale in a very participatory and engaged community. So with that, thank you everybody. And I think, do we have, we have about five minutes for questions. So let's open it up. This is uh, for Barbara. When you were comparing the, the researchers and the independent data scientists and some of the big oh, testing uh -huh. providers and who's succeeding, how are they doing relative to each other, just out of curiosity? Oh, well, actually, we can't quite tell you that yet. For one thing, the um, data scientists are still at it. But stay tuned. In a couple of weeks, we'll be able to reveal. I think you'll be very, very excited. We are very excited about it right now because we sort of know what the numbers are. There, it's actually, a, there's a public leaderboard and you can actually tell where the public uh, data scientists are and we kind of know what the other number is, but we can't tell you that yet, but okay. we will soon. So. But, but we'll, I'll just add, what, what we can say is that the vendors did very well and actually most of the vendors really did approx approximate or even do better than human scoring in terms of reliability. So, uh, so we can, we can say that as a group without announcing specifics. Um, are they going to make the, um, their uh, algorithms for doing those analyses open so other people can use them? So <laughs> that was a 
That was a interesting and, and difficult decision that we made. Um, given that this was the first competition and we wanted to maximize momentum, we did, we did not require that they open up the IP on the individual competition. We will go in and partner with them and who knows if there are things that we're interested. We're in a position where we could provide funding to help incentivize them to open it up. I will say that there is one open source solution that was in both competitions from Carnegie Mellon, in fact. Um, so what's interesting is that there is at least one open source solution here that could be used in many different contexts. Question, I thought I saw one back there. Susie. How much are you looking to, on, on, the, on the point of open source, how much are you looking to um, look to the future of funding more open source projects and looking at open infrastructure as well as open initiatives and open content? So you're talking from uh, a development technology perspective yes. as opposed yeah. to content? Yeah, the innovations. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think we're pretty selective on those. Um, we're, I, I would say we're more in the, the, the content range and that's where we are focusing a bit more. Um, but uh, there are certain occasions where we may support an open source tool or something if we feel that it's a clear barrier and could potentially kind of have a trajectory shift and, is a and also has a demand base built in. So I think you know we are open, but it's, it's less than what we did before. Hey, Vic, uh, advice from me, Dan. Could you talk a little more about what um, your interests are in the, the mobile and tablet space and, and what sorts of uh, uh, projects you, you might be looking at or content access or evaluation or all the above? It's a good question. And I think it's something that we're in the sort of formation stages. Um, I think. Uh, Part of it, and what interests me most, is assessing demand more and doing more rapid iterative kind of experiments to see what people will download and engage with. Um, and I think mobile really provides that. The other area actually to, to just touch on um, is mobile devices, especially smartphones. You know, obviously no one's going to write book chapters on a smartphone. Um, but what they are good at is, first of all, they have wonderful cameras video cameras as well, and they're great for sending tweets and things like that. And so I think the field is still pretty nascent overall outside of OER in terms of really using mobile for learning powerfully. I think there are possibilities though for potentially capturing student work pretty dynamically, posting that, um, and facilitating interaction given that this is obviously where learners are pretty comfortable these days. And uh, the whole notion that we should have them put away cell phones when that's really what they're doing <laughs> is, uh, is a difficult one in the long term. So, Carolina? Yep. The use of uh, we did a lot of research in the use of mobile in Brazil and other countries such as India and the Arabic speaking countries which are the focus of the foundation now in the global team and uh, they are really not even editing Wikipedia, right? Which you would think yeah. would, they are not even editing Wikipedia even mm -hmm. if they have smartphones and many mm -hmm. times they don't have the smartphones, right, in developing countries. So there is a lot of data now and we did a partnership with the internet uh, uh, a steering committee in Brazil to do some research on that. So there, there's a lot of okay. research, public research on that that you guys can see on how people are using and what are the apps people are developing to help people edit, yeah. like some, something as simple as Wikipedia. And that there are a lot of barriers. So I think we are still really far away from big edits. Uh, so it's, yep. it's just an input there because uh, it's ways to go, I think, in, in, in this Absolutely. interactivity. Go for it. Um, and, and just a quick comment. I was at a, are any of you familiar with the nonprofit technology conference? It's uh, a couple of folks are. Okay, so that's, it's an annual conference. Um, uh, consists of like nonprofits and NGOs from around the world, and they all talk about their use of technology. And I was at this conference last week, and it was uh, there was a lot of a lot of conversation about mobile. And I think that one of the points that we're making here is that. Um, if you're thinking about mobile 
as a platform after, after the design phase, then it's too late. Right. You're, it's, um, what we're encouraging is to think about mobile as a possible platform while you're designing your curriculum, as you're revising your curriculum or the, the modules that you're working on as a, as a possible platform. Um, and I'll just throw one quick e geeky thing out there is um, try Mobify. Um, it's a very, very quick thing that you can uh, take any website and um, run it through Mobify. They have a free version of it and you can see what your site looks like on a mobile uh, platform. It's very easy to use. David? Uh, so connecting the OER work with the deeper learning work. Mm -hmm. One of the places it seems like commercial content development is going is to diagnostic and adaptive. Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem to be a lot of diagnostic and adaptive work going on in the OER space. Mm -hmm. Partly that's a platform question. It's also partly an assessment question, because diagnostic and adaptive is powered by assessments. And the overwhelming majority of OER collections don't publish any assessment at all, don't openly license assessment at all. It's just a gaping hole in the field around open assessment. How do assessment and how do diagnostic and adaptive play into kind of future plans? Didn't hear a lot about that today, but it seems a, a pretty big risk for us as a field. Go ahead. Go for it. Just, just, so, let me just, oh, I'll quickly add something. You know, I, I think one thing to think about too is that um, this is a good opportunity for us as a field during our, you know, when we have the cluster meetings, when we're talking about these issues, when we're um, meeting with other people like who have identified as builders or learners or facilitators to think through those very specific questions and say, well, what are the interventions that we could do as a field, or what are the suggestions that we have, and how can we bring those forward? Because, I mean, we'll have some thoughts on it, but we are certainly not the holders of all of the answers of the, of the field itself. And we're highly dependent upon the expertise of the field to come up with those um, ideas and answers. So just one, one plug Absolutely. for the clusters. And I think I'll echo that. I, I think it's a risk. And actually, I, I limited the risk to five just because I didn't want to be a downer. But uh, <laughs> data, data integration and assessment was one of the ones that, that I trimmed off. And I think it is critical. It's something that um, we need to work on. Open assessment, I think part of the strategy is first, just the field of assessment in general is very black boxy. You know, there's five groups that have a thousand PhDs and nobody knows really what they do type of thing, right? And so that's why part of the competition is actually we're gonna do a series of competitions where we're gonna move, next we're gonna do short response, uh, written response, which is actually harder to do than long form. Then we're gonna do mathematical manipulation. And I could see in a year, year and a half, we could do crowdsourcing portfolio assessment and move to some things that are pretty innovative. Plus we will be pushing the open side, I think, once we get some critical mass and participation. But we see this as a field building effort that we would like to do to help grow the field of assessment, make it more of a community, and hopefully open it up. Um, but that said, there's also just technical details of thinking what an appropriate strategy is in terms of embedding data in OER, having good assessments that, uh, that can start to track whether they work or not and feeding back that data. We are funding some work actually, that reminds me, with the FET sign simulations uh, and Dan Schwartz from Stanford to actually track the click streams, use that data and see if we can use them as embedded assessments kind of as pre and post, and for things like critical thinking, problem solving, and even learning to learn the metacognition side of it. So we're dabbling, but that's something where we definitely are looking for, for help and, and advice thinking through. How are we doing time-wise, I think, are we? All right, sorry, let's wrap up. Please feel free to approach any of us. We're looking for continuous feedback and improvement over the next three days. So I'm in the somewhat uncomfortable. <laughs>